The destruction in the Bahamas is unreal. That's the verdict of Barbados PM Mia Motley as CARICOM leaders offer aid. Amazon leaders call for curbs on deforestation, but they're not addressing what environmentalists say are the root causes of the fires. Plus, we will fight the white man. We will fight until the last of us falls. For you. Tributes pour in from African leaders for Robert Mugabe, who has died at the age of 95. Hello and welcome to Talisur. I'm Doris Pulu in Quito and this is from the South. Unreal. That is how Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley has described the destruction caused by Hurricane Dorian in Grand Bahama and the Abaco Islands. She was speaking following a tour of affected areas along with other CARICOM officials on Thursday. The delegation visited the worst affected islands for a first-hand assessment of the damage caused. In an update, PM Mutley said moving goods across the island is difficult at this time. She also stressed that the Caribbean must prepare to withstand similar disasters, as this is the new normal. The reality is this is the new norm for us in the region. We've had a number of um, storms in the last couple of years, but in particular Category 4 and Category 5 hurricanes that really um, threaten to undermine our stability and we therefore have to prepare for it. We have to build the resilience, we have to build back differently. We need to look at our roofs, we need to look at our building standards, we need to look at the areas of flooding, we need to be able to educate our population to be ready all the time so that the days of hurricane parties and storm parties are really a thing of the past. We have to be ready, it's as simple as that. This is our new existence in a world that is bedeviled by climate change and global warming. Jamaica will also assist the Bahamas by sending soldiers for relief efforts. There are already um, partner nations on the ground in the Bahamas assisting with the search and rescue. Jamaica has responsibility under Sedema for the Northern Caribbean. And we will be sending an advance mission to the Bahamas this morning. We will be flying them in um, on our aircraft. Uh, and then later this evening, we are going to be sending a full mission, um, our full disaster assistance response team. As the extent of the destruction on the island of Grand Bahama becomes clearer, one senior official in the tourism ministry said there were still hundreds, possibly thousands of people missing. The official death toll still stands at 30. Meanwhile, dozens of Hurricane Dorian survivors were stranded at the destroyed Abaco Airport on Thursday as residents awaited relief efforts following the deadly storm. Some survivors were able to pick up a few relief supplies trickling into the small airport on Abaco Island. I honestly believe Abaco is finished. Um, I think Abaco will not recover until the next 10 years like fully recover because everything is gone absolutely everything is gone so in order to have money you need people to invest i don't think people are going to invest anymore because of the devastation so it's a it's a chance that i don't think people are willing to take and right now abaco need external investors the Central Bank of the Bahamas says the storm damage will impact the country's external reserves well into 2020. Despite this, reserve indicators are expected to remain above international benchmarks. Dorian ravaged two of the three largest economies in the Bahamas when it leveled Abaco and flooded Grand Bahama. Despite this setback, the Central Bank says medium-term growth prospects are still positive for the Bahamas. Shifting gears now, the president of Peru, Martin Vizcarra, has called on countries in the Amazon to reverse the deforestation of the region. Vizcarra is taking part in a summit hosted by President Ivan Duque in the Colombian Amazon town of Leticia. 
President Evo Morales of Bolivia and Lenin Moreno of Ecuador are also present, along with delegations from Brazil, Suriname and Guyana. The summit was called in response to the fires which have destroyed large areas of the Amazon in the last month or so. But there is no indication that it will question the model of economic expansion based on logging, mining and large-scale agribusiness, which most environmentalists blame for stoking the fires. Now, as the leaders talk in Colombia, there is little let up in the fires burning across the Brazilian Amazon region. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Ignacio Lemos, has the details. Fires are still burning in Amazonia, the area that has seen most of the environmental destruction in the last month. The Brazilian foreign ministry has launched a website with data on the region and the fires. The foreign minister, Ernesto Araujo, says this is to counter the misinformation that's circulating. But despite this marketing campaign by the government, the fact is that it has cut 38% of the funding for the monitoring of forest fires in 2020 by the National Space Institute, INPI. We should remember that President Bolsonaro sacked the head of the institute after he questioned its report on a sharp increase in deforestation in the Amazon. And now the president is cutting its funding. That is on top of a 67% cut in funding last year for MP and other organizations that monitor deforestation. Jair Bolsonaro is not taking part in the summit of Amazon leaders that's taking place in Leticia on the Colombian border with Brazil and Peru to discuss the fires. That's because he had surgery scheduled for the same day. Thousands of people across Brazil held rallies on Thursday to call urgent action to protect the Amazon forest. The protesters marched on the streets of the country's major cities with banners and posters denouncing what they called President Jair Bolsonaro's harmful environmental policies. They say the thousands of fires in the Amazon are threatening the lives and livelihoods of the indigenous communities who live there and the climate of the planet. As part of the Day of Global Action for the Amazon, protesters in Washington, D.C. headed to the White House to protest against what they say is the complicity of U.S. companies in the Amazon fires. Alina Duarte reports. Concerned about the devastating fires in the Amazon rainforest and about climate change, protesters in the U.S. headed to the White House. For the Amazon, for the climate. They are looking to draw attention to the responsibility the United States has over what is happening in Brazil's Amazon. The United States is greatly responsible when it comes to transnational corporations, which of course President Trump is representing. They are investing there in order to be able to extract natural resources for their profit. They say certain players are behind the fires. These fires we know are not accidental. They are being driven by a small handful of small, powerful agribusiness companies that are backing Bolsonaro and who are driving land clearance to expand their soy and cattle empires. Among them, companies like Cargill, which claims that it works alongside farmers, producers, retailers and other organizations to accomplish its purpose to feed the world in a safe, responsible and sustainable way, but activists don't agree with this. One of the companies that we have found most closely linked to the fires, Cargill, is actually headquartered here in the same building as the Brazilian consulate, coincidentally. And so we are standing out here today to let them know that we know you are behind these fires and that the public is unwilling to buy your products that are causing the destruction of these forests. Social organizations have made a call for citizens to act beyond social media. It's time to call in your favorite supermarkets, Costco, A-Hold, Walmart, to immediately su uh, suspend contracts with the companies behind the fires, specifically Cargill and JBS. And the time to act is not tomorrow, it's right now. In an attempt to find a solution to the current situation in the Amazon, Congressman and son of President Jair Bolsonaro, Eduardo Bolsonaro, traveled to Washington, D.C. However, no specific agreements were reached. 
President Bolsonaro has announced his son will be in charge of the bilateral agenda with the Donald Trump administration. He is also looking to appoint him as Brazil's ambassador to the U.S., an appointment that, according to lawyers in the Senate, controlled by Bolsonaro's government, does not amount to nepotism. It is important to mention Eduardo Bolsonaro already has President Donald Trump's approval. The Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, has said he wants peace with Colombia, and that is why he ordered military exercises along the border. He also criticized the United States for trying to dominate Latin America. He was speaking to China Central Television. I issued an orange alert to mobilize the National Bolivarian Armed Forces for special military drills from September 10th to the 28th because we want neither armed conflict nor war. We want peace, and any country that is eager for peace should prepare to defend itself. The sanctions against Venezuela imposed by the Trump administration are totally unjustified. They are interventionist policies that seek regime change in the country and seek to dominate our country. It's the Monroe Doctrine of America for the Americans, but they think they are the only Americans and that all the rest of us, the Americans of South America and Central America, the Latin Americans, should serve the interests, the business and the power of the United States. We'll take a short break now. When we come back, Mexico boasts of slashing immigration to the U.S. by more than half. Join us again after this. Welcome back. Reactions from African leaders are coming in following the death of Zimbabwe's first post-independence leader, Robert Mugabe. He passed away at a hospital in Singapore after months of treatment. He was 95. We will fight the white man. We will fight until the last of us falls naked. Mugabe rose to power as a champion of the anti-colonial struggle and an African hero. Mugabe suffered imprisonment and torture under white minority rule in what was then known as Rhodesia. The former political prisoner turned guerrilla leader led Zimbabwe from the independence from the UK in 1980 to 2017. He was, however, forced to resign in 2017 under military pressure. Mugabe leaves behind a mixed legacy. He's hailed as a liberator icon and founding father of Zimbabwe who introduced a policy of racial reconciliation. He also extended and improved education and health services to the black majority. Later in his life, he became known for violent repression of his political opponents and was blamed for ruining Zimbabwe's economy. Still, he is remembered for his enduring positive contributions. He is our former president and he liberated us from the colonialists, as well as giving us land. Zimbabwe is the only country that has a billion dollar bill. One billion dollar bill. It's just like 1,000 naira, but it's only Zimbabwe that has it. Why? Because of their money doesn't have value, their money doesn't make sense, their money is just big, let me just say big for nothing, because the level of economic statistics or level of economy that that um, Robert Mugabe did was actually a failure. So now he's dead. I just believe one of our problems are solved. I'm sorry. Our correspondent Matuba Malachi in Pretoria has mourned Mugabe's death and reactions from across the African continent. There's been widespread reaction here in South Africa after the death of uh, President Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe. And Zimbabweans here in South Africa that I've spoken to still see him as one of their own, even though they are suffering. And the reason why they're here in South Africa is because of the tough economic situ uh, situation there in Zimbabwe. President Emerson Mnangagwa, we've also seen him writing a tribute to the former president, uh, Robert Mugabe, calling him a hero of the liberation struggle back in Zimbabwe. But here in South Africa, South Africans are, see, are divided on what, the, what legacy he's left. Some see him as a man who 
excited over a dictatorship and some see him as an icon of the struggle against the British colony in, back in Zimbabwe. But what we've seen in the past few days, xenophobic attacks here in South Africa, Zimbabweans were bore the brunt of most of those attacks because they are here, as I've said, because of the tough economic uh, situation back in Zimbabwe. But the, the days of mourning will be declared in time and more reaction will surely follow as we prepare to see how, when uh, President Mugabe will be buried. It's back to you, studio. Our correspondent Matuba Malachi with that report. Mexico's foreign minister said the government has slashed undocumented migration to the United States by 56% since May. Mexico is aiming to avoid the Trump administration imposing more tariffs on Mexican exports. The strategy Mexico has set has been successful. It would not be convenient to change that strategy. We will continue with that strategy. Mexico will continue with that strategy in accordance with its legislative measures and what the president has decreed. I do not think there will be a threat of tariffs. Meanwhile, Haitian and African migrants have clashed with security forces in southern Mexico as they demand visas to continue their journey north. Mexico has seemingly stopped its practice of awarding humanitarian visas that allow migrants from other countries to pass freely within its borders. The Immigration Institute said it would prioritize giving visas to vulnerable groups, including the elderly and unaccompanied minors, while offering temporary shelter for others. Bolivia's government has put into effect a law to combat cancer and provide free care for all those afflicted by the disease. President Evo Morales has put into effect the cancer law, which obliges the state to develop a broad prevention and detection policy, but also provide free treatment for people who have the disease. Official figures show that 15,000 people in Bolivia have cancer. They will all be able to get free medical treatment and care. Cancer is a cruel and painful disease. If it is not diagnosed on time and not properly treated, it affects not only the patient, but the entire family. For our children, because they are defeating cancer, they are our best examples of the fight against the disease because despite the pain and all that they have to suffer, they always wake up with a smile. I thank you on behalf of all fathers that have children with cancer in Bolivia for passing this law because it's not only a law for us, it gives us hope. Basically, what it is that for the first time in our country, we will create conditions for the state to take responsibility of the whole process of care, early detection, diagnosis, treatment, and even in the final phases of the cancer process, palliative care. The Bolivian government is already providing assistance to cancer patients from low-income communities. At the time of passing the bill, nearly 500 people had access to free radiotherapy services, an investment by the government worth nearly a million dollars. In the capitalist imperial system, they say to the poor, save yourselves as best as you can. There are no social programs. You'll see how it is for our brothers and sisters in neighboring countries where neoliberalism has returned and they are privatizing everything. The law creates a board that will develop proposals to implement health policies. It also creates a national registry of patients in order to have a program of monitoring to guarantee the care and free provision of medicines and job stability for people that are undergoing treatment. Coming up, Britain's Prime Minister faces another hurdle as the Upper House passed a bill to block a no-deal Brexit. Don't touch that remote. Welcome back. The Upper House of the British Parliament, the House of Lords, has approved a bill to prevent a no-deal Brexit. The legislation forces Prime Minister Boris Johnson to ask for a three-month extension to Britain's European Union membership to January 31st. That is, if Parliament has not approved either a deal or consented to leaving without agreement by October 19th. The Upper House approved the bill without a formal vote at its final stage. It is expected to be signed into law by the Queen later on Friday. 
Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he isn't willing to contemplate resigning from office if he fails to finalize Britain's exit from the European Union by October 31st. That is uh, not a hypothesis I am willing to contemplate. I want to, us to get this thing done. And, you know, I think the people of this country also do. And there's an opportunity to be so much more positive about all this. I, st I still think that there's, you know, so much negativity around about uh, this country, about what it can do, and about Brexit. Pope Francis has touched down in Madagascar as he continues his six-day trip in Africa. Pope Francis was received by President Andrew Rajolina and military honours. During his visit, environmental issues, especially deforestation, are expected to be high on the agenda. The Pope is likely to address poverty, war and corruption as well. In Madagascar, about 44% of forests have disappeared over the past 60 years. And to make matters worst, 80% of its fauna and flora are not found anywhere else in the world. Algerians have protested for the first time since Army Chief Ahmed Gaid Salah called for a date to be set for presidential elections by September 15th. For the past 29 weeks, demonstrators piled into the streets of the Algerian capital, demanding an overhaul of the political system. Algeria has been without an elected president since protesters forced the resignation of Abdelaziz Bouteflika in early April. We came here today to remove the gang and to call for peaceful protests. From the very beginning, all we want is for the gang to leave. A Turkish court has sentenced a prominent opposition leader to almost 10 years in prison for insulting the president and spreading terrorist propaganda. Kanan Kaftan Sioglu is the head of the Republican People's Party, or CHP's Istanbul branch, and one of the strongest opposition voices within the party. She will not immediately go to jail pending appeals. <laughs> We now go to the Dominican Republic to learn about a demonstration by Dominican women to demand justice in cases of gender violence. Dozens of demonstrators rallied in front of the Supreme Court of Justice after the most recent femicide in the country, which has been described as a death foretold. This case reflects something that they want to deny, that in the Dominican Republic there's an epidemic of gender violence and gender inequality, an epidemic of femicide, and there's also an institutionalized system that protects and allows violence and femicides to occur, which does nothing to stop the abuse. Anibel Gonzalez is the most recent victim of gender violence at the hand of her former partner, Jasmine Oscar Fernandez. He fired several shots at her and then and killed himself in San Pedro de Macorís. After she was wounded, Anibel tried to seek help. She was taken to a medical center and died hours later. He murdered her in front of the three girls, aged 11, 8, and 3, and then killed himself. This is the result of a mistaken policy to reach a kind of agreement. This goes against the law and all legal principles and has been echoed by the remarks of the public prosecutor's office. This is what we are against. This event has caused deep distress throughout the country. The assailant had been arrested after stabbing her in 2017, but he was released from prison following an agreement reached with the public prosecutor's office of San Pedro de Macorís. There is an environment of impunity and corruption here. You see what the justice system did. A group of persecutors and the judge, they were all complicit in releasing that man. Who knows how much money he paid to get released, to go and kill here and leave those three girls as orphans. We need serious public policies, starting with a reform of the school curricular to dismantle the macho mentality that makes our men believe that women are their property and that they can hit us whenever they want. Machismo kills women. No more impunity. Not one more life. Zero tolerance for the aggressors. That's what the protesters chanted before lighting candles in memories of all victims of femicide and against the irresponsible behavior of the authorities in cases of gender violence. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net.
And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.